Rockaways Productions presents The Casey Waters Show, episode 285, Is the World Geostrotive? Hello, I'm Casey Waters. Today, I will continue with the last Grateful Dead concerts. Here, I describe my experience at the last three Grateful Dead concerts in Chicago, Illinois, July 3rd, 4th, and 5th at Soldier Field. These were the Fare Thee Well shows, the last shows that Mickey Hart, Bill Kreutzman, Phil Lesh, and Bob Weir play together. It was some wonderful shows, hearkening back to the 80s when I used to see them then. And then it's on to Is the World Geostrotive? Here I look at a new concept, a new word I made up, geostrotive, describing a condition where one receives guidance from a higher power to improve one's situation or one's life. This happens continuously, even though it might be hard to detect. Today's show will feature background footage from the Deep Gap Trail on Mount Mitchell, North Carolina. I had to return to it. It's so beautiful. It's enchanted. Everything's covered with moss, all the fallen trees, and the bottoms of all the trees that are growing. Sure, much of the ground is covered with moss, too. It seems to be a magical environment, a place where a hobbit might emerge at any moment, or perhaps it could be used on a Disney movie. To get to the Deep Gap Trail from Asheville, North Carolina, take the Blue Ridge Parkway headed north. After about 45 minutes or so, take a left onto Highway 128, heading into Mount Mitchell State Park. Follow the road, Highway 128, to the end at the summit. Well, if you haven't been to the summit, you might as well hike that first. It's a short, easy hike, perhaps only two or three hundred yards. And then, after you're done with that, go back down the parking lot. And just before the parking lot turns into the road, park in the last parking space you can find on the right. There. There's some picnic tables, and the Deep Gap Trail goes down from there. It goes through the Enchanted Forest, then down some rock steps. I made it further this time, going down the rock steps to the bottom, and then it goes up again. And I went along, but not all the way to Mount Craig which is the next peak. Perhaps I'll make it that far in the future. So now, let's continue with the last Grateful Dead concerts. It was a classic drum solo, with Bill Kreutzmann rapping hard on the drums with nice sharp beats. Then he would almost run into the drums and hit a big kettle drum and make the whole place thunder. Oh, gee, wasn't it nice? He used to do this, this intense drumming back in the 1980s, where he would hit the kettle drum and shake the whole Coliseum. It's good to see him do it again. Then it was on to Stella Blue, a mellow song from the Mars Hotel album. Even though Jerry typically would have sang it, Bob Weir sang it, this time on the 4th of July. Then it was one more Saturday night. 
which they always play on a Saturday night. Every single Grateful Dead concert or related bands, such as Further and Bob Weir and Rat Dog, every time they play Saturday night, they play one more Saturday night. So after one more Saturday night, there was the encore, which was U.S. Blues, a classic song. Summertime, done, come and gone, my oh my. Anyway, after U.S. Blues, there was a wonderful fireworks display capping the show. So this probably started, I guess, around midnight or so, maybe later. The fireworks went all behind the stage with numerous fireworks going off in a classic display. But then there was more fireworks coming up from alongside of the stadium and exploding almost overhead. So it was like fireworks in 3D with some fireworks going behind the stage and the occasional stadium streamers, as they call them, with long tails that are sparkly as they shot up above the stadium side and then exploded overhead. They played patriotic songs during this display, such as Stars and Stripes Forever. Gee. And now, finally, the final Grateful Dead concert on Sunday, July 5th. Many people say this was the best concert, but in my view, they were all the same, each being as good as the other. Sure, there were, they played wonderful songs all three nights. You betcha. It's hard to say which one's actually the best. Going back into the past with the many other Grateful Dead concerts I saw, about 50 Grateful Dead concerts and maybe 50 after the Grateful Dead, seeing Bob Weir and Rat Dog, Phil Lesh and Friends, Further, and so on. Well, they were all were wonderful concerts, both the Grateful Dead concerts and the concerts done by the remnants of the Grateful Dead. And when I look at them all, well, it's hard to say which one was really the best. The final three concerts didn't necessarily stand out from the rest as being exceptional, but they all were really exceptional. Sure, they always put on a good show. They really do. It's kind of sad to think that it's all ending, but maybe not. There's hope. There might be another band coming along, Golden Gate Wingmen. Golden Gate Wingmen formed from the remnants of Further and Phil Lesh and Friends and Rat Dog. They don't have Bob Weir or Phil Lesh with them, but who knows? I heard they play pretty well. Hopefully I'll see them. But let's get on with it. The last concert of the Grateful Dead, July 5th, 2015, Soldier Field. Started out with China Cat, Sunflower. Sure, a classic song of theirs. They might have skipped some of the words, though. Then it's a jam and into I Know You Writer. These songs are often played together. It was really nice. Then, a real treat. Estimated Prophet, with Bob Weir singing it, as he typically does. My time coming, any day, don't worry about me now. Sure, this song, well, to me, describes the future of the band. And how, well, how the band might somehow lead us to heaven. Sure, standing on the beach, the sea will part before me, fire wheel burning in the air, and you will follow me, and we will rise to glory, way up in the middle of the air. Sure, it has some classic lyrics to this song. It, it really has a personal 
meaning to me. As I said, I see it as the future of the band, about how it all will theoretically end. And it's nice to think that they did the song that describes the end of the band at the final concert. Gee, isn't that nice? But then it's on to Built to Last. Built to Last is from the 1986 album or 85 album by the same name. Then it's on to Samson and Delilah, a classic Grateful Dead song. Then it was Mountains of the Moon, which is one of their older tunes from the late 60s, maybe even the mid-60s. They started off in 1965. But then to end the first set, it was Throwing Stones. I haven't seen them do Throwing Stones all the way since the mid-80s. So it was really a refreshing song to see them do. You betcha. There are different versions of this song. Actually, I like the earlier version better. The one from the early 80s. And it has a wonderful, slow, pretty intro. Um, typically, the version they played in the early 80s. Sure. And it's a political song. The politicians throwing stones and the kids, they dance to shake their bones and it's all too clear we're on our own, singing ashes to ashes, all fall down. Sure, and picture a bright blue ball this spinning, spinning free. It's dizzy with possibilities. And that's how the song ends. Then it's on to set two. They opened up set two with Truckin', a classic song of theirs. Perhaps I, perhaps I have seen them do Truckin' more than any other song. But then it was on to Cassidy, a real treat. I haven't seen them do Cassidy since the mid-80s. Sure. And the concert is called Fare Thee Well, these last three concerts at Chicago. And that's what... One of the lines from Cassidy is fare thee well. Fare thee well now. Let your life proceed by its own desires. Nothing to tell now. Let the words be done. Let the words be yours. I'm done with mine. Sure. The, and after Cassidy, there was Althea, which was sang by Trey Anastasio. From what I sensed, I feel he really enjoyed doing this song. Then it was on to Terrapin Station. Terrapin Station also describes the end of the Grateful Dead, at least to me, and I'm assuming more Grateful Dead fans would say Terrapin Station describes the end instead of Estimated Profit, but I say they both do. Anyway, Terrapin Station, in the shadows of the moon. Terrapin Station, I know we will be there soon. Terrapin, I can't figure out if it's the end or the beginning. But the train's got its brakes on and the whistle is screaming. Terrapin, sure. Anyway. So after Terrapin Station, there was the drum solo in space. But this one was a little different without the sh uh, so much of the sharp beats by Bill Kreutzmann and Bill Kreutzmann thundering away on the kettle drum. It was more of a spacey jam to it, with Mickey Hart taking more of a lead role. And so the drums went into space, which was mostly Mickey Hart, and then After Space was Unbroken Chain, a long song by Phil Ash, a nice classic song, which I haven't seen him do many times. But then it was Days Between, a powerful metaphysical song by Bob Weir. I think originally Jerry Garcia sang it, though. It's a beautiful, mellow song. 
sure about it. Oh, well, it's about life and life's lessons. A beautiful song indeed. And then it was Not Fade Away, which is a classic Grateful Dead song and which really generates a lot of audience participation. At the end of the song, after the band stops playing, well, because it was the end of the concert, they walked off the stage, which is what they typically do. They usually do the song at the end of the concert. And then the fans sing and clap, know our love and not fade away. And then they'll clap a few bars of the song and then sing again, know our love, not fade away. And so on and so on. And so this went on for about 10 minutes and then they came back for their encore. First they did Touch of Grey from In the Dark album in the mid 80s. But then the last song was a real treat for they did two encores and the final song of the final Grateful Dead concert was Addicts of My Life. I think I've only seen them do it one other time. And that was at the final three Grateful Dead concerts with Jerry Garcia that I saw in 1995 in Charlotte, North Carolina. This was in the springtime. So it was nice to see him do Addicts of My Life again. Maybe I saw him do it one other time, I think. But it was only three times in all, I believe, that I seen him do it out of a hundred or so shows. And so that's it. That's the final Grateful Dead concerts. Sure, a lot of wonderful songs. Well, to understand these songs better, I encourage you to listen to them yourself. And the concert itself is available on CD and DVDs. Sure. Anyway, it was a very nice concert, or nice three concerts, and I feel very privileged to have attended these three wonderful shows. After the last concert, everyone was kind of sad and somber, at least some people were, since it was the last Grateful Dead concert. In fact, one Grateful Dead fan named Andy, was sitting at one of Chicago's numerous monuments that are along the street. He was sitting there crying, saying that a 35-year chapter of his life had just ended. And it was so wonderful going to all these concerts. Now what is there to do? Well, it is sad indeed. But perhaps it's not over. As I said, there's always Bob Weir and Rat Dog, Phil Esch and Friends, and, as I said, a new band called Golden Gate Wingmen. Perhaps they are worth checking out. And perhaps they will continue to tour over the next few years, perhaps sustaining us deadheads into the future with more great concerts, and good music. But it's more than just the music. For the Grateful Dead attract the kindest fans I have ever seen at any concert. Sure, and they always do, at all 100 or so shows that I have seen. The kindest, sweetest, courteous bunch of people. Sure, if there's a fight about to be breaking out in the bathroom because somebody's too drunk and there was a minor misunderstanding, the fans will quickly calm everyone down before the first punch is even thrown. I've seen stuff like this happen a few times, but it is pretty rare, for people rarely even get agitated with each other at these concerts. As I said, typically everyone's courteous and friendly, open, loving and compassionate. A real nice scene. 
hopefully one that will continue with other related concerts. As I said, perhaps by Phil Lesh and friends, Bob Weir and Rat Dog, and maybe Golden Gate Wingman. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed this section of the Casey Water Show. Now, it is time for Is the World Geostrotive? Here, I describe a new concept, well, a new word, rather, that I created, perhaps describing an old concept. Sure, but an old concept that could be worked in many ways. And so I guess I'm going to work it a different way. And so thus it is a little new. Anyway. So what is geostrotive? Well, geostrotive describes a condition um, where you um, have a world or even the whole universe that is tailored to communicate useful information and the useful that's useful to each individual on a unique basis so each individual gets unique individ gets unique information that is useful to them at all times. So once again, it's a concept that describes a world or a universe that is tailored to constantly communicate useful information that is tailored to each individual to assist each individual at all times live a happier and more productive and a more spiritual evolved life. Sure. All this was inspired by hearing Katie Did's chattering in the summer night a few weeks ago. Sure. So this information comes to you constantly, at least in theory, it's just kind of hard to detect. And it guides you as to what to do and how to see situations, how to live your life in a more stable, inspired way, and how to inspire others, how to make the world a better place spiritually and a better place as far as being happy. Sure, that's what it's all about. Receiving the information that will help you do these things. And it's the world that's geostrotive. So the whole world is set up to communicate this useful information to you at all times. And this useful information, I guess, is coming from God, of course. Sure. Anyway, geostrotive sounds a lot like geostrophic. Well, geostrophic, that's a meteorological term. I remember learning about the geostrophic wind in meteorology class. It's the way the wind operates under most conditions, especially where you don't have friction, where you're at a higher altitude, let's say perhaps a couple thousand feet or more above the ground, or you're in a low friction environment, perhaps going over the ocean. Well, friction pulls the air to the left and the Coriolis force pu pulls it to the right. And so the wind blows between cold, dry air that is denser and warm, moist air that is lighter. So you have the wind blowing between these two extremes. In the northern hemisphere, the wind would blow from the west to the east with the cold, dry air to the left and the warm, moist air to the right. 
and it undulates sometimes, sure. So it's not always east to west. Sometimes it's almost north to south in these undulations. But with the warm, moist air to the right and the cold air to the left, cold air is denser than the warm, moist air because cold air could compact more molecules into an individual cubic unit volume of air of space rather the unit volume of space could hold more molecules when it's cold because the molecules are packed closer together they're vibrating less also moist air water is actually lighter than the nitrogen and oxygen that make up most of the air so when the air is moist it actually will weighs less because these heavier molecules are displaced out of the unit volume of air. It seems a little paradoxical that moist air could weigh less than dry air. But anyway, so you have the air would want to flow straight from high pressure to low pressure, straight from the cold to the hot. But it is steered over time to the right by the because of the Cor Coriolis force of the turning of the earth and then to the left from friction from the surface of the earth. These forces balance out and the air travels with the warm moist air to the right and the cold dry air to the left. Well the geostrotive wind pushes us along so to speak and guiding us in a way, as we travel through life. But it is tailored to communicate useful information to each individual. So, we have this guiding message. This message, this information that is useful to us, that guides us, that is tailored to our unique needs that we are receiving at all times. Sure. Casey Waters Show. Producer, Casey Waters. Photography, John Blackwell. Email us at CaseyWaters2 at CaseyWaters.com or call 828-808 4265